Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all this morning. It's about time for us to begin. Maybe a minute or two past. Um, we are going to pick up. Uh, we uh, we're going to pick up with what I had meant to get to Wednesday night, um, and that is talking about the death of John. Um, and this is kind of an interesting. Um, it's interesting the way the death of John is presented. Uh, because we don't find out about it until after the fact. Um, you know, a, a lot of times you know, talked about the, um, uh, I believe, uh, was it James? I think it, 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 it says, you know, right when it happened, it, it talks about the death that Herod had, had put James to death. Um, but we're kind of going along here, and then there's almost like this parenthesis um, where... Uh, there's uh, the people are talking about Jesus, and then we kind of go back in time a little bit, and it tells us what happens to what happens to John based on what the people are saying about Jesus, uh, and so it's uh, we 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 learn um, after the fact uh, what uh, what happens to John, uh, and so that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. So. Um, if you would, please uh, take a moment with me and let's, uh, let's have a prayer before we begin. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another day of life. We're thankful that we have this Lord's Day to gather together to remember our Savior uh, and to pray to you, to sing together, uh, to lift our voices in praise, to uh, hear your word, to read your word, to consider it. Uh, and we're so thankful, Father, for the freedom that we have to be able to do this without fear. We're thankful for the, uh, uh, the, the place and the time that has been granted to us, that we're able to do this in comfort. We realize, Father, that many of our brethren throughout the world don't have the same comforts, but they persevere anyway. Uh, and we're so thankful for them and pray your blessings for them. We pray your blessings for us this morning, Father, as we open your word, as we study and we learn about uh, John and, and how he suffered uh, for you. And he suffered for the cause of Christ, uh, and he was willing to give his life, Father. And we pray that we can have the same faith, the same perseverance, uh, and the same hope uh, that John had uh, as we live our lives so that we will continue to serve you come what may. Please be with our brothers and sisters who can't be with us this morning, Father, who would want to be here but are being prevented, and we pray that those obstacles can be removed for them to be back with us soon. We pray that you'll forgive us of our sins, and we're so thankful that through Jesus we can have that forgiveness and have a hope of eternal life. We pray that your will will be done, that our, our Bible study will be beneficial this morning. And that your name will be glorified in all things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want to what I want to do first this morning is, is just begin by I want to read uh, Matthew's account of this. But so we're gonna be in Matthew chapter 14 for a, a majority of the time this morning. But if you'd like to mark uh, Mark chapter 6 and Luke chapter 9. Um, so we're Matthew 14, Mark chapter 6, and Luke chapter 9. Uh, but we're going to read from Matthew 14. We're going to read Matthew's account uh, this morning. So, Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, 
having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. And when Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the city. So what we have here uh, is, as I said, the uh, kind of a, 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 a parenthesis where we learn what's already happened to John. And we don't really get this in Matthew, but if you go to Mark's account and Luke's account, we find out what the people were thinking about Jesus as a result of his good works, of his teaching. So go over with me to Mark chapter 6 and verse 14. Mark chapter 6 and verse 14. Uh, it says, King Herod heard of him, the end of Jesus, for his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead, therefore these powers are at work in him. Uh, and so, uh, the uh, again, Jesus' name was becoming well known. That's how her, Herod heard about Jesus. Go, go down with me to verse 15. And others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is the prophet or like one of the prophets. And so what the people were saying about Jesus is, so this is the one that was prophesied about. This is the Elijah that was prophesied would come. Well, who was the Elijah that was prophesied that would come? It was John the Baptist. Um, and so, the, but they were saying this about Jesus. They're saying he is Elijah. And then Mark chapter 6 and verse 15 again, he says he's like a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. And so this is how we learn about John is because of what the people were saying about Jesus. The people thought Jesus was the forerunner, but the forerunner had already come. That was John the Baptist. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, if, if you look back over there at... at uh, uh, Matthew chapter uh, 14 or Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 and 14 um, it says when Jesus came to the region of uh, Caesarea Philippi he asked the disciples saying who do men say that I the son of man am and, said, and some said some say John the Baptist and some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets so this is what was being said about Jesus uh, and so word gets to Herod about what the people are saying about Jesus. And so then what does Herod think? Herod thinks that John the Baptist has risen from the dead uh, because Herod had already killed John. Well, that's why I said that you know, we kind of go back in time a little bit here. Kind of this, uh, we learn after the fact what happens to John. Uh, and so there in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 2, this is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead, from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. And so um, what had led Herod to arrest John? Hmm? Herodias, and, and what specifically about Herodias? So Herod and Herodias were living in adultery. They were they were uh, they were in an adulterous marriage. Uh, and John, knowing the old law, and also knowing, you know, what God expected of marriage, because this is what God expected of marriage even before the old law was given, is that. Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Okay? And so he confronted 
Herod and said, it's not lawful for you to be married to this woman because she is the wife of your brother. Which is a little gross if you think about it too. But, you know, he, he, was, he was living in adultery. And ultimately, I mean, that, the adultery wasn't what led to John's arrest, but it was John's bravery. It was John's courage to be able to stand up to the king and say, this is not right. This is not what God expects from you. And was Herod a Jew? Yes, Herod was a Jew. And so he was expected to follow God's law just like any other Jew would be. Uh, and so it was John's courage ultimately that led to his arrest. And so is there a lesson there for us, do you think? The fact that John stood up for what was right and what happened to him. He died. He was arrested. He was thrown in prison. And ultimately, he gave his life for it. So the lesson for us is, sometimes when you stand up for what's right, good things don't always happen. But was it good for John ultimately? Oh, it was good for John ultimately. But, you know, we are going to suffer in this life if we stand up for what's right. That's, that's the lesson. But what was it? We're told here in Matthew chapter 14 that Herod wanted to kill John. But what prevented Herod from killing John? Fear. Okay? Fear of, of whom? The multitude. He said he feared the people because they counted John as a prophet, and rightly so. Because was John a prophet? Yes, he was. Uh, and so they feared, uh, or he feared the multitude because they counted John as a prophet. But, you know, we get a little bit more information over in Mark chapter 6. Go, go back over there with me to Mark chapter 6, and let's look at, uh, at verses 19 and 20. Um, Mark chapter 6, verse 19 said, Therefore Herodias held it against him. She held it against John, and you know, John had confronted um, uh, uh, Herod about this and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Look at verse 20. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Not only did uh, did Herod fear the multitude? He said he also feared John and enjoyed listening to John and hearing what John had to say. Now, unfortunately, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, Paul, almost you persuade me to become a Christian. Um, Herod didn't make any changes, obviously, uh, based on what he heard. Uh, do you know people like that that really enjoy, uh, maybe enjoy hearing the truth, but you know they really never make any changes? They enjoy discussing religion, and and, and you can do it with them really without much animosity and without much you know not any contention, but they never take it to heart. And this is what we see with Herod uh, is that you know he was he liked listening to John, but. He wasn't really, he wasn't willing to make the changes that needed to be made uh, to get himself right with God. Now on the flip side, we have Herodias. And how did she feel about John? Well, we just read over in Matthew, or Mark, Mark chapter 6 and verse 19, that she held it against John, uh, that he would confront Herod and, and say, you know, you don't have a right to be married to this woman. Um, and so she held a grudge against John. Um, and what did she want to do because of how much she hated John? She wanted to kill him. She wanted him dead. And so... Um, 
Maybe we've got a visitor. Um, and, and so over in Mark chapter 6 and verse 21, uh, look what, what it says there. Mark chapter 6 and verse 21. Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a great feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. The key word in that verse is opportune. What does that tell you about Herodias? She was looking, she was looking for the perfect opportunity to get rid of John. Do you know people like that too? Who, you know, they think the answer to their problems is getting rid of the people that tell them the truth. You know, that, that so, you know, and, and you've probably maybe had family members or friends or, or someone who have said, you know, if you're going to talk about the Bible or if you're going to talk about God, if you're going to talk about religion, then I don't, just don't bother. Don't bother to come see me or don't bother to, you know, show up for whatever. Uh, and, you know, now Her, uh, Herodias took it to the nth degree here uh, and, and ultimately was looking for a, play, a, a way to completely get rid of John. But did that solve her problem? No, that doesn't solve the problem. Get rid of, getting rid of the person who tells you the truth doesn't get rid of the problem. It just allows you to continue in the problem. There's a scripture, and I can't remember what it is. It's in my and I'm telling you the truth. Exactly, and that's that's the Apostle Paul, and, and I can't remember exactly where that is either, Don, but I know what you're talking about, where he, he tells those that he's addressing. It's one of it's the one of the epistles to the churches, uh, but but he tells them. You know, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? And unfortunately, you know, we do become people's enemies sometimes by telling them the truth. And so, you know, that's, a, that's unfortunate. But we can't stop telling the truth because it makes enemies. Uh, the truth has to be, to be told. Um, and so, what was it ultimately that led to John's death. Uh, and I think there's two things here. Two things that led to John's death. What's one of the things that ultimately cost him his life? He felt that Mary thought he was illegal marriage. Okay. And, and that's, you know, that's what, yeah, I think that's what ultimately, you know, him telling the truth. Um, and, and confronting Herod, you know, that led to his arrest and ultimately did lead to his death. But, I, so, the, I guess the, the final, what finally caused the blade to drop? Well, the first thing is Herod's lust. Herod's lust. On his birthday, Herodias sent her daughter. And I, I don't think it, it, it reveals it in the scripture, but from secular writings and historical writings, we're actually told that Herodias' daughter name was Salome. Okay? So and that's, uh, it's, it's, that's easier than saying Herodias' daughter, so I'm just going to say Salome from now on. So Salome came out and she did what appears to be a very provocative dance. And her dance so incited the desire and the lust for Herod. What did he do? He made an oath. It's a very rash oath. He said, because you have pleased me so well, I will give you anything you want. Up to half my kingdom. So it was his lust. 
that would, when it was incited, that led him to make a rash oath. And that's what led to John's death. That's part of what led to John's death. So there's a, there's a lesson for us in this. Following one's lust often leads us to do things that we might not otherwise do. When we let ourselves be drawn away by our desires, our unlawful desires, sometimes we will do things that we might not do in other circumstances. Can you think of an Old Testament example where somebody <coughs> had their lust? David. David, that's the one. David and Bathsheba. David, how does David describe it? As a friend of God, as a man after God's own heart. Yet here he was, he sees a woman bathing, and his lust gets stirred up. And it led to adultery, murder, lying, deceit. That wasn't David's that wasn't David's normal character. But because he allowed his lust to run away from him, he did something that he would not otherwise do. So that's the first thing, Herod's lust. But the second thing that ultimately led to John's death was the conniving of Herodias and her lust for vengeance. Again, there's that word, lust her desire, her lust for vengeance, you know, and who would know better how to incite the lust of Herod than his wife, it's not an awful wife, but his wife, she would know best what would get him to that point, and, you know, we might even kind of read between the lines, you know, that she arranged for her daughter to dance for her. I, I have no doubt that she did. That she, it says when an opportune time came, and it was Herod's birthday, I have no doubt that Herodias was behind Salome doing this very provocative dance for Herod. And it's interesting here that when Herod makes this promise, this oath to Salome, what could she have asked for? Up to half my kingdom. Now, that sounds pretty good. Until you realize who it was that made the promise. It's kind of an empty promise. What was Herod's kingdom worth? Who was Herod? Herod the Tetrarch, so he was one of three kings that were set up by the Roman Empire. So he was a puppet king under the Roman Empire. So offering her up to half of his kingdom wasn't much because it really wasn't his kingdom to begin with. It belonged to the Romans. And so kind of an empty promise um, to, to, to offer her up to half the kingdom. But what was she told to ask for? John said, on a plan. Now how much was that worth? You, have you ever heard, the, uh, I'm sure you've heard the, the, the uh, the saying, one, man, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Well, who was this going to be a treasure for? For Herodias. Because it was going to get rid of the one who was causing so much trouble. It would mean the end of someone calling, up, calling Herodias an adulteress. So really, who, was, who, would, who got the reward? It wasn't Salome who got the reward. It was erroneous. But again, it was an empty reward because it didn't solve her problem. 
it just made her problem worse. To have a truth teller put to death was really more of a punishment than a reward. And so then when Salome comes out and she, uh, she makes her request to Herod, how did he feel about that? He was sorry. Okay. Uh, he was grieved. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 9. King was sorry that he had made this promise. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, which we've already read, kind of gives us the reason why he was sorry. Because he feared John and, and because he liked talking to John. Um, that's over in Mark chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. So he was sorry, but how else did he feel? Look at Matthew chapter 14 and verse 9, the, the, the second part of that verse. The king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. He was sorry, but he felt honor-bound. He felt honor-bound to fulfill his oath. Now, this is interesting because while he was not a good enough Jew to follow the old law as it pertained to marriage, he was a good enough Jew to follow the law as it pertained to keeping your oath. Because over in, look with me at Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2. Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2. If a man makes a vow, and this says to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So Herod at least had still had some connection to his, you know, to his roots, to the old law, uh, in that he made this oath and he felt honor bound to follow it. And also, he had witnesses. <laughs> there were those who had witnessed him making this oath. So again, that just, that drove him having to fulfill it, Ms. Sharon. I don't think honor in the law has anything to do with Right. He was caught in public. Right. Right, so it might have been more guilt, <laughs> you know, guilt or or not wanting to lose face. Uh, so that good good point, Bill. Making an oath to do something wrong is not right. That's <laughs> true. I mean, That's you know true. I mean? That's pretty <laughs> profound, Bill. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Making making an oath to do something wrong. That's the same right. I don't think the law intended for that to be binding. Right. Well, well and can you, can you think of another person who made a foolish oath? Jephthah. Remember, he, he, he told God, if you'll make us victorious, I'll, serve, I'll, I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out of the gate. When I returned home, and he came out, his daughter, his only daughter. But I thought he just thought his wife was going to come out. Uh, I'm not touching that one, Bill. But and, and so I mean, we see the, the 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 danger in making foolish oaths. Um, so how quickly then did he fulfill his oath? Two years or so. No, it, it, I mean, it, he started it right by the way, but it didn't happen until you know, after she completed it. Okay, well, I'm talking about her hair oh, okay. and killing John. It was immediately. He, he did it immediately. Um, and so, what did Salome then uh, do, with, do with her reward? She gave it to the one who requested it. And that was she took it directly to her mother. So as as I said, 
um, it was truly Herodias' reward, and, and if you want to call it that. But, and, and this is always kind of, I've always kind of wondered about this. I wonder what she did with it afterwards. I mean, you can only imagine what, what she did with that. Um, but she, she got what she wanted. Um, and then, so what became of, of John's body after, after he was beheaded? Yeah, his disciples came, took his body, and laid it in a tomb. And, you know, what I can say, if, if there's a good thing to be said for Herod here, is that at least he allowed the disciples to come and take the body and, and take care of it. Um, so, um, the disciples then, after caring for the body in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 12, they buried it, and then they went and told Jesus. So, you know, so Jesus learns about the death of his cousin, of his, the forerunner that had come to prepare the way for him. Do you think Jesus was surprised that John had met such an end? I doubt it. Because you remember when we were talking about Jesus talking to his disciples, he's about to send them um, on the limited commission. And what did he tell them was going to happen to them? Just about what happened to John. Uh, and so, you know, John was doing the Lord's work. And so I don't think Jesus was surprised at, at what happened to John. But we do see kind of his reaction. In verse 13, when Jesus heard it, he departed there by boat to a deserted place by himself. And so, you know, what that tells me is that Jesus was grieving. He was grieving at the death of John. Um, you know, we, we talked about, I believe, in uh, on Wednesday night where it, it, the Old Testament passage that says, you know, precious in the sight of God is the death of his holy ones. Um, and, you know, so you know, Jesus would have grieved. And he needed to be alone. Just like, you know, we all do when we're grieving sometimes. We just need to be alone. We just need to be somewhere by ourselves where we can think about things and and... What else do you suppose Jesus was probably doing? Praying, okay, praying for comfort, um, you know, uh, giving thanks for all John had done. You know, I'm reading a lot into this, but, um, but you know, this is what we do when we're human, as, you know, when, when we're grieving. We go to a place by ourselves, we think about things, we contemplate things, contemplate our own mortality, and we pray. And Jesus was human. Uh, and so I have no doubt that he did the same thing. So, Jeff, yes ma'am. Jesus, well, you just said was human. John was his cousin. Yeah, absolutely, he was family. You know, not only, yeah, yeah, they, they, not only was he a disciple of Jesus and a forerunner for Jesus, but he was, they were, they were related by blood. Um, and so that just that made the grief, I'm sure, you know, even more uh, profound uh, for Jesus. So uh, absolutely. So as we wrap up this morning, I want to just you know hit hit on a few things. Some of the I've already I've kind of hit on some things as we've gone through, just some lessons that we learned from what happened to John. But I think there is uh, you know there's some lessons that we can learn from his death. Uh, that may help us. And, and the first, uh, first is perseverance. John persevered to the end. Um, in spite of his imprisonment, I don't see any indication that John ever stopped telling the truth. That he ever stopped preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom of God. When he told Herod 
it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife? What was he telling Herod to do? Repent. <laughs> Change. This is not right. So he was still preaching up until, I have no doubt, the day that that sword fell. He persevered to the end. Um, go back over to Mark chapter 6 and verse 20. Uh, Mark chapter 6 and verse 20. Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man. He protected him. When he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Who was, who was John preaching to when he was in prison? He was preaching here. So he never stopped uh, to the end. And uh, if you look, go back over to Matthew chapter 10, uh, in verses 22 through 25, Matthew chapter 10. Um, and, and again, this is Jesus before he sends his disciples out on the limited commission. He tells them, you will be hated for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel but before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. John knew all of this. He knew about you know persevering to the end. And John was hated because the message that he brought was hated. And Jesus was hated, so John was hated, and John paid the price that he persevered to the end. So that's the first lesson. Second lesson is the fact that the works of a righteous man live on. Why did the people compare Jesus to John? Why did they think Jesus was John the Baptist? <laughs> because of John's good works. John had preached the gospel of the kingdom. He had done uh, good works. And so when Jesus came along and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom and he was doing good works, oh, this must be, this guy's just like John the Baptist. So John's works were a testimony to him and led to Jesus being compared to John. And... Who did the people compare John to? Elijah, the prophets, Jeremiah, these men of old who had done good works, mighty deeds, and preached great works. So it's true for us too. You know, I, I talked about um, Sunday morning, last Sunday morning during the, the sermon. Our legacy. What legacy do we want to leave? If the only legacy that we leave to our children is a bunch of money and a bunch of stuff, that's not much of a legacy. The legacy that we need to leave is a spiritual legacy. It is a, a legacy of someone who always stood for the truth, and always did what was right, not always, but tried to do what was right. If we leave that kind of legacy for our children, we're going to live on. Okay? The stuff will go away. But if we leave a spiritual legacy, if we leave the works of a righteous man or a righteous woman to our children, that legacy will live on. And the third lesson. That's that John's physical end was not the end. It wasn't the sword falls and that's the end of it. Yeah, John came to a bad end physically, but spiritually, we know that this was not the end for him. He had a better home waiting. You know, um, 
you look at, at Hebrews chapter 11, where it talks about those people who had great faith, who were seeking a city whose builder and maker was God. They didn't see the promises fulfilled during their lifetimes. But the Hebrew writer tells us they didn't care because they were looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. And, you know, I've, I've had people tell me that the people under the old law really didn't know that much about the afterlife and what God had planned. But I think Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that they did. And I think John did. John knew that there was something far better waiting for him. So he knew that even if he gave his life for speaking the truth, he would be a citizen of that city whose builder and maker was God. Okay, but well, we're, we're just about out of time. So we'll quit there for this morning. Wednesday night, we are going to take a look at two more of the miracles of Jesus. We're going to take a look at the feeding of the 5,000 and uh, Jesus walking on water. So I will try to remember to send those out. Uh, well, no, actually it won't be this Wednesday because we'll have singing this Wednesday. So next Sunday morning then we'll talk about uh, those two miracles. And so uh, I'll try to remember to send those readings out ahead of time. Thank you all so much for your, your participation this morning. Sure. Yeah. That last thing I got for this new slide is Okay. So, do you want all the verses of all of us? I guess three of the verses on the five. Okay, three of the verses on number five, but all of the verses on the rest of them? Yeah. Okay, gotcha.